Can you take the time to tell us a little about how Sabian symbols are made? Sure. Okay, symbols are made starting with copper and tin um, to make bell bronze castings. It starts with 80% copper and 20% tin. And then we do the, the old family secret of combining these two metals to make B20 bell bronze. And I could show you here when I hit these two base metals, it doesn't sound like anything, right? But using that secret of combining these two metals, you wow. get a B20 bell bronze casting that already has a musical pitch just in the very infant stages of what will become a symbol. So what we'll do then is we'll take this casting, we'll heat it back up, we'll take it um, and put it through rollers and turn it each time so you get uh, what's a waffle grain that forms at the molecular level of the symbols and that strengthens it and makes it pliable and terms they like to use malleable and ductile and metal and that just means it's really flexible and you can bend it um, and beat that's it up with a can, stick and, and it doesn't though. break you know so that's where that starts so after they roll it out they check it with a micrometer to make sure it's the right thickness for whatever symbols they're making and you end up with a big flat piece of metal like this wow now this was totally flat and then they put it in this uh, uh, drop hammer and that's smash it down and it forms the bell of the symbol in this flat piece of metal and then uh, before they do this though one of the most important steps happens they heat it back up to a very specific temperature in an oven when it's just a completely flat piece of metal and they'll drop it into a vat of water at a very specific temperature and what that does is temper it and that freezes the molecules at that precise point that they have to be in order be, uh, to be able to work the metal and uh, in order for it to accept a profile and all the hammer marks that you put on it and whatnot. So tempering is one of the most important parts uh, of what we do. And I don't believe this is tempered. And I can just wow. tear <laughs> pieces of metal right out of the side of this thing when it's untempered. That's how fragile it is. So once it's tempered, you will never be able to do that. You know, and so that's why you can it's just like glass. I mean, you can pick chunks out of this all day long because it's not been tempered yet. So that's how fragile it is in the early stages. Um, and what they do next is they'll take it, they'll drill the hole in the middle of the symbol so it obviously can be put on a stand after they put in the cup like that. Uh -huh. And then they'll start putting in the profile of the symbol. They'll put it in this another big machine that puts the profile in the symbol. Um, and then they'll finish it off. Depending on what type of series of symbol that's being made, uh, they'll either hand hammer it um, to get the profile right where it needs to be. Um, and then they'll take it to the lathe machine once the profile is set into the symbol and they shave off that dirty outside finish that you just saw in that blank and that's how you get the shiny, shiny bronze that you see here on a finished symbol. So that's the quick definition of how a symbol is made. So Chris, symbols all basically look the same to a lot of people. Can you tell us a little bit about the differences in looks and how they're made? Sure. Well, it starts with the metal. Uh, you know, I just showed you B20 bell bronze. The only other metal we use to make symbols right now is B8 sheet bronze. And uh, it has a more copper penny-like color to it. That's this inside plate here? Yep. It tends to be much brighter sounding um, because there's more copper in it, which is a... Uh, uh, it just contributes to more of the brightness in the sound than the B20 bell bronze has, which you see looks a little bit more. Sometimes people mistake it for brass um, or a gold kind of color. Um, so that's the two difference in the way you tell the difference between the two types of symbols. So B8 bronze is much brighter and B20 is uh, a little bit more flexible in what we're able to do to it um, to change the sound of the symbol. And the, the two major ways to tweak the sound of a cymbal is by directing the vibrations through it, the metal and also across the surface of the cymbal. And the first way we do that is with the hammer marks. You know, you see all the different dimples in these cymbals, some of them more pronounced than, than others. Um, what happens when you hammer the metal is the vibrations travel faster through those dimples. So basically just redirecting vibrations every time the vibration travels through the metal. And with the different size hammer marks and the different force that you hit the bronze with, it changes the sound of the cymbal, sometimes in large ways, sometimes in small ways. So that's one of the, the major, major things we do is hand hammer cymbals. Um, and uh, the century old uh, technique of art of hand hammering cymbals is the, you know, the most traditional way of tweaking that sound. 
And uh, we also use several different machines um, that have different types of hammer marks uh, that direct the vibrations in different ways. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool, you know, uh, if you like to geek out on cymbals, yeah, you know, to get, really cool. get to know it at that level, you know, it's really neat. Uh, so does that have a big part in fo as far as uh, how fast the cymbal's going to decay? Absolutely. Um, we did an experiment uh, a couple years ago where we took some pieces of plexiglass, thick right. plexiglass, and we took it to each one of the hammers that we use in the factory, and we put the plexiglass underneath it, and what we found was, and what we suspected all along was, that plexiglass would break just in the same way the vibrations would shoot through the bronze. So, for example, the, the AA hammer mark, uh, these little tic-tac hammer marks, you can see there's just a thousand of them on this one symbol here, that shoots the vibrations directly out of the side of the hammer mark. So you get a much more high-end, poignant type of tone out of the symbol, and it sustains longer because the vibrations are directed uh, concentrically in circles around the symbol instead of out the edge. So you touch the symbol and it you know, relaxes really fast. So um, there's some trade-offs in what, what it does to the tone. You know, the AAX, it looks like, uh, oh, almost like a, a BB hole in a pane of glass. It just kind of spiders out really short wow. and quick and just a lot more mild, not like the AAA hammer where the, the marks just immediately go out very far. You can tell it's a really strong punch. You know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, being stepped on by, you know, a 90-pound little lady with a pair of high heels. You know, it's going to hurt a lot. It's probably going to puncture you, right? As opposed to, you know, somebody that would weigh, you know, if I were to, to step on you with my whole shoe, it's probably not going to hurt you that bad. Well, it, it may, but, um, <laughs> but it's just the, the difference in how the force is, is put into the, to the metal and how the vibrations are directed. So the hand hammering, just like you might expect, is completely random. Depending on, you know, what hammer is being used, what, what craftsman is hammering the symbol, all the marks will be completely different. So every hand hammered symbol has got completely unique character. Um, as far as I know, Sa Sabian is one of the last companies around that yeah. actually has someone there you hitting know what? it with a hammer. We're really proud of that. You know, we're not making car bumpers here. You know, we'd be able to automate this stuff, but then you're not getting a, a, a unique, high-quality, um, uh, human-crafted instrument. We, we still see a lot of value in that, and we think uh, most drummers do too. So, you know, it costs a little bit more, but to get that centuries-old craftsmanship, it's the way it has to be done, yeah. you know. So th that's one way to, to change the sound of the cymbals through the hammer marks by directing those vibrations. Now, the other way is by the lathing. Now, I showed you that raw symbol there. Here's another example of a symbol that has not been lathed. You see it's just got the natural, raw, dirty finish on top. Right and uh, gives it a little bit drier of a tone um, because the vibrations really can't move across the surface. It's all coming through, uh, through the bronze. So you, this being a ride cymbal, you're going to get a lot more articulation and dryness out of the cymbal because uh, the vibrations aren't traveling across the surface. But the trade-off is you don't get that real bright, sparkly, and, and good crash, type, brilliant type of sound. Exactly. Um, so the two different lathe patterns that we use are the traditional wide, deep lathe. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, um, if you're walking across the field, you know, it's easier to walk across the field that's flat and uh, not a whole lot of peaks and bumps and valleys and whatnot. Well, the deep, wide, traditional lathe like this china right here, as opposed to this lathe right here. And what I'm talking about is the surface, just the right, ripples how, across the surface here. And how fine and yeah. close together the, the yeah. lathing is done. So when I strike a cymbal that has the deep wide lathing, the vibrations going across the surface have to climb out over all these big waves um, that have been created in the surface. And what that does is it makes the cymbal sustain longer and it also gives you more high end uh, punch to the cymbal. Um, and a little bit more brightness because of that, because it's withholding the vibrations concentrally, concentrically in a circle a little bit longer than the symbols that don't have this deep wide lathe. Like this uh, signature Virgil Donati saturation crash, for example, has the pinpoint lathing on top. Now this one, you just strike it and the vibrations just gliss off of the surface. So now the trade-off is you get a much quicker response out of that symbol. Um, a symbol with the wide lathe, you have to hit it a little bit harder in order to get it to open up and speak its real voice. Um, but the pinpoint lathe symbols, you just touch them, they open up, respond immediately. But you probably trade off a little bit of the very long sustain and very 
uh, high-end, high frequencies that you get out of an AA symbol, for example.